Generating traffic and sales can be a challenge for online merchants. But selling on the Walmart marketplace puts your products in front of millions of customers who shop on walmart.com. And right now, sellers who join Walmart Marketplace can save up to 50% on referral and fulfillment fees for the first 90 days. So get started today. Head over to marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. That's marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. Welcome to E-Commerce Conversations, a podcast by Practical E-Commerce. What's going on, Internet? Eric Banholtz here, founder of Beard Brand, and we are back with another e-commerce conversations by Practical E-Commerce. I've got a special guest in here, as always, Catherine Lavery. Yep. <laughs> She's with Best Self, and uh, they, they sell um, journals, among many other products. So why don't you give us a quick little rundown of, of your business, how long you've been in business, how you got established, and uh, what it's currently looking like. Cool. Thanks for having me. So we started about three years ago with one product on Kickstarter. So we started with the Self Journal. That's kind of our flagship product that people know us by. Since then, we've gone into other productivity tools and frameworks around either goal setting or achieving something. So if you're a writer, we have a wordsmith deck that helps you prompt every day to write. We have the Edison deck to help you come up with ideas. So everything that we create is based around helping you achieve something or improve your life in some way. Yeah, I've noticed it seems like journaling has been a really large uh, movement and a lot of people are investing in themselves. And a big thing at Beard Brand is to keep on growing and investment in yourself. And you know, I've seen like journaling as a big part of that. Now you mentioned you, you launched on Kickstarter. I personally have never done a Kickstarter before because it just, frankly, it seems like an incredible amount of work and I'm not that organized. Maybe <laughs> I should, <laughs> I should do more journaling. Tell me like, what should uh, an entrepreneur expect if they're going to launch on Kickstarter? You know, what's realistic? What are the things they need to do and how does it go? So with Kickstarter, some people make the mistake of they think, okay, I'm going to put my project on Kickstarter and people are just going to give me money. So what you want to do is it's great for validation that people actually want your idea because there's no better validation than someone actually giving you something before you make it. So you're essentially pre-selling your product. So there's a lot of people on Kickstarter that shop on Kickstarter. So the great thing about crowdfunding as a platform is people are there to buy your story. Unlike Amazon or your store, like Amazon, people are on there to buy a product. Your store, people might be interested in your story, but on Kickstarter specifically, people will watch a three minute video on why this thing is ex exists and give you money to fund it. So it's really great for building a tribe of people, validating your idea. So there is a lot of work that goes into it to sort of craft that story. But what I think of it is it's a way to kickstart a business. So for us, the reason we went to Kickstarter is because we didn't have the money to do an initial run of product. And we're like, oh, maybe our friends seem to like it. Why don't we see if we can get a bigger audience on this? Because then you can create like a run and actually consider making it a business. So for us, our goal was 15,000. So that was the minimum amount that we needed to manufacture it with the company. And we ended up hitting 322,000 in 35 days, which kickstarted our whole company. So we didn't, we've still not gone out elsewhere for funding. Everything's gone from sales. And so there's a huge validation to getting that amount of money. It allows a lot more control because you have full control over everything. You're not actually giving equity away to all these people. You're pre-selling your product. So if we, we pre-sold uh, 10,000 units of our product, but we had enough money that we bought 30,000 units of our product so that we could actually create a sustainable business. So when I advise people when they're starting on crowdfunding, it's what is the minimum amount you need to make this product? And then also consider how do you turn this into a business? Because the last thing you want to do is always have to kickstart the same product. So if you're raising money, how do you raise enough to fund a run that can also start a business from it? So if you sell 100 units on Kickstarter and you only make 100 units, then there's there's a little 
flaw there because you're not actually creating something that's sustainable. So what you want to do is figure out what's the minimum amount you need to create what you can sell on Kickstarter and what you can actually start a business on. And then I always like to go for the minimum amount because you want to create momentum. So that first 48 hours on Kickstarter is the, it's really the make or break because that's when you have people coming in and backing and you want to get funded as soon as possible. So for us, our goal was 15,000, which we hit in 28 hours. And then what there's not everyone's an early adopter. So even though on Kickstarter, you technically get your money back. A lot of people go in there. It's like, I'll wait and see if it gets funded and then I'll maybe back it. And once you get fully funded, you're like, well, I better get on this. And then you can start doing like uh, stretch goals and things like that. But there's a lot of momentum if you get that funding early and then you can sort of Kickstarter will reward you. So any Kickstarters that that I've done or that I've advised on, I've generally seen about 35 percent of total pledges coming from just people that browse on Kickstarter. Like they have probably 5 million backers on there that just constantly back projects. I'm one of those people. And I like to think of Kickstarter as like a uh, a secret Santa to yourself because what happens is you back something and then you forget that you did that. Mm -hmm. And then a year later you get a box in the mail and you're like, oh, sweet, (laughs) something I wanted. Yeah, that's pretty amazing that you're able to, I mean, what is that, 200%? No, 2,000%? Yeah of what you were planning, that $15,000 that you were planning in those early days, was that to build a business or was that more of just getting the product out there? Do you think a business could have started from that? A business could have started from that. I think that was based on a minimum order of a thousand units Mm -hmm. with some leftover to sell. So you're funding a thousand units at the sales price that you want to sell it at, but not at the, at the price that you're going to buy it at. So, so you need to create some margin for yourself, but no, if we had only made 15,000, well, we might've sold the product and turned it into something, but it definitely wouldn't have been like a hell yes. Oh my God, maybe this is the business we should be doing and not this other thing that we started on the side. Yeah. I think that's really one of the nice things about Kickstarter is you're getting that validation. How much of that momentum was just from the platform Kickstarter and how much was it because you were out doing PR, you know, press releases and trying to like, just almost like that startup energy that you have for a new product, really just trying to get it out there. So for us, we built an email list up for the three months prior to the Kickstarter starting. So when I said you want to get that initial momentum, Kickstarter has an algorithm. So like the most popular projects will come up first. And those are based on the amount of backers that pledge rather than the amount pledged. So say you had like a thousand backers giving a dollar each. And then another project had 10 backers giving, you know, 2000 each or something. They will value your project more because you're putting more eyeballs on it. And they have repeat backers coming in. So they want as many people on that page as possible. So there's people that are going to be on your email list that don't actually want the thing that you're selling. But if you can create some sort of reward level at like $1, a lot of people won't have a problem with giving a dollar. And that actually helps the algorithm within Kickstarter, and then you'll get more organic traffic. So I like to think you were going to send, you're going to send like 60 to 80% of your pledges from stuff that you do. And then depending on how popular your project gets through social media or people sharing or the platform will send the rest. But a lot of the initial work is going to be for you. So it's going to be about like building your email list. So for like Beard Brand, it might've been like YouTube videos around how to take care of your beard and then be like, oh, this is a product. So you want to warm people up and like teach them about the problem that you're solving. And then, oh yeah, here's, here's a product that solves this problem. Yeah. How how were you able to build up your email list? What were the strategies and tactics that you did? So you didn't have a business, no product at all. So yeah, we didn't have an email list or, or a product yet. We started from scratch, I think in April mid-April 2015 and we launched in August so we went from like nothing to 3200 or something and we did a giveaway so we basically found a bunch of products that people that would be interested in our product would like so like 
productivity software, bulletproof coffee, um, books, like I think there was about $800 worth of stuff. And that got us about 1600 email addresses. That giveaway was like through Facebook marketing? It was or? through King Sumo. Okay. So I have a pretty detailed blog post about exactly how we did it. So that was one of the big things. Another thing was creating content. So for us around productivity, it was like, oh, here, here is um, how you create a morning routine. And then it was like good free content. But then at the same time, I reached out to like 25 people I knew or, or other things that I'd read and created like an infographic book of like, here's 25 entrepreneurs and exactly what their morning routine looks like. So if you want to just copy someone else's, here they are, but you have to put your email address in to get that. Yeah. And so I created some like content upgrades around that. And we posted on Medium because we didn't have like a website and would visit. So Medium was a good for us. And if you create quality content, then you can get submitted into publications on there that have, you know, I think at the time there was like 60,000 people reach. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the content, I would just put this like, oh, if you've enjoyed this, put your email in. And I got quite a few from there. And what was also great about that is like once the Kickstarter was live, I just replaced that content upgrade with, oh yeah, here's our Kickstarter. Yeah. So uh, we'll get a, a link to that blog article. So mm -hmm. the listeners, if you come to Practical e-commerce, you can uh, find that link and, and read that article in a little bit greater detail. What are kind of like the check boxes of things that you need to do to have a successful Kickstarter? We talked a little bit about the video and like the, the kind of like the, the levels of mm -hmm. uh, commitment. Go through like all, all the things that people need to prepare for to make sure that they launch successfully. So definitely a video, like that's a no brainer. When people try to launch without a video, I'm just like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, also reward levels that make sense. So typically if you're selling the thing, everyone just wants the thing. People don't want a t-shirt with your name on it. Like nobody knows who you are. So when you complicate the reward levels with these random things, it just complicates your back end, and you're giving people stuff that they don't even want. Yeah. So, how, how many rewards should you be shooting for? Is it like 10 or five or? I think we two? started with eight. Okay. And then you kind of listen to feedback and see what else. But for us, it was just like a journal, two journals, four journals, eight journals, 10 journals. So it's very like multiples of whatever the thing was. Um, and then towards the end, we added like a cover. So you, so you want to just make the rewards super simple to get. So people don't have to ask questions. You also want to have early bird rewards when you start. So I like to, early bird rewards are limited rewards that go fast because usually they're discounted. So you might have 200 early bird rewards available. And the reason to put these in is because you want to get funded as quickly as possible. And these ones are going to be gone. So my sort of calculation is the early bird rewards, which we had on like one product and, and, the, and the two pack, we, if you kind it up like 200 of this one and 200 of that one, they would have technically been 80% of us, our way to goal. So it's a way to kind of manufacture, how do I get funded quickly by creating early bird rewards to, reward people who come onto your page and back right away. Okay. With the video production, is there like a particular story arc or something that performs better than like, do you need to have the story or can it just be about the product or what are the best practices for creating that video? I find the best ways to do it is you kind of introduce yourself. You talk about a problem that you were having prior to this. Usually it's like, I had this problem and then you describe the problem. Then you talk about solutions that didn't work and then you introduce your product and then why, what the benefits and, and the features are and then what is needed to get this product into someone's hands. So it's kind of like the problem agitate solve model in a human way that makes people connect to you. Okay. Let's segue a little bit. You're on Kickstarter what about Indiegogo like, or other platforms out there? Is this something that you launch on both platforms at the same time or you transition or what are the differences between? So for, for me, I've only done 
launches on Kickstarter because I think there's more traffic and people shopping there. But what a lot of people know now is they launch on Kickstarter, but then they go on on demand on Indiegogo, which is technically like a second fund on Indiegogo once your Kickstarter ends so that you can keep collecting pre-orders prior to actually having the product. So that works really well for people. Okay. And then from an operational standpoint, I, I know in the early days, like you essentially don't have the capital, but you know, three years in, you're more successful. You, you probably know the operational aspect of things. You could theoretically have all your products ready and just do it as mm-hmm. like a fancy pre-launch. Is that a successful tactic for Kickstarter or should it always be for these products that you want to test the marketplace and, and see the validations in it? So I've seen both work well. I've seen businesses that keep going back to Kickstarter, sometimes for the same product, just a new addition. Um, For us and for other companies that I kind of look at, they will go to crowdfunding for like a brand new product that they kind of want to test the market and also get some sales in before they make it. So for us, we went back to Kickstarter for some for a hardware product because we're like this is a lot of money up front for like injection molding and all the rest of it so why don't we see if people actually want this thing and then collect some money before we go make it and I've seen that for other businesses where it's like kind of another vertical in the same category but they don't want to take the risk so they, they go to Kickstarter. Okay so I wanted to talk about you know like kind of segueing into to new products and, and new offerings and, and really like, um, the expectation for, we kind of talked about it when you're branching into something new, like what are the time frames that are realistic for people to expect to get the product? You know, like, do they generally want it within three months or six months or how do you best manage that process if you're completely new to something? So if you're completely new to something and you have no idea, I would always take what you think you can do and then double it and then don't promise delivery even if it's tight like if you're like it's going to be there by Christmas don't ever do that I say that from experience where because then people are like well they said it's probably going to be here for Christmas so now it's definitely going to be under the tree and I don't have to go shopping and everything sorted so I wouldn't do that I for people like that they've created a product similar before and they know they already have a manufacturer in place it's really just a a case of putting an order in that you can kind of have a pretty good idea. And I would always add a little like padding to it because the best thing that can happen is it's there early and people are like, oh, great. And the worst thing is when you have to delay it a little because there's an issue. Yeah, I feel like there's so many horror stories just revolved around the platform or or one of the big knocks on the platform is just people who aren't entrepreneurial. They don't know how to manufacture products. They don't understand margins that are necessary to, to make a profitable business. Uh, so like just really make sure you, you go conservative with your numbers, Yeah, you know, like definitely. Sure. And, and account for shipping. A lot of people, I've done a Kickstarter before where I didn't account for shipping, especially international. And then you see this number of money that you raised. And then I actually did a blog post. I'm like, here's how much money I didn't make because I didn't account for shipping or anything like that. And that stuff like really eats into your numbers. So I would, once you have a prototype, r- go to the post office or figure out with your, supp- you know, your mail, how much it's going to cost, like best and worst case scenario and, and be conservative towards the worst case scenario. Yeah. And I would always encourage entrepreneurs, not just on Kickstarter, but everywhere, try to, to win customers with your story and not the price. Yeah. So if you can focus on that story and the value that you add and the benefits you bring to the, to the consumer or the customer, that's going to be a lot less stressful than playing on margins and and really trying to be competitive in the marketplace, but different strokes for different folks. Let's kind of segue like, so, so you've built a successful Kickstarter campaign. How does that transit transition into the business model and the e-commerce side of things? Like, is it just like this super high spike where you, you get, you know, $300,000 mm-hmm. and then it's dry for the rest of the year until the next Kickstarter? Or how do you transform that into like ordinary sales? So for us, we just did the first Kickstarter, which ended September, 2015. And then 
We took a few months to get our store together and we launched on Shopify on January 1st, 2016. And then we didn't do another Kickstarter until 2018 for a completely different product. So for us, it was like, okay, this was enough to get us started. Now, how do we get consistent sales? So we built a community up like a Facebook group of people and we really just were engaging with them. And like you said, where you don't want to ever compete on price, you know, I I also feel that way because for us, our journal initially was like a premium journal. I think it was one of the most expensive ones. But what we were able to do with that gives you margin where you can make things that will help people use the product and you have some sort of budget where you can use it to give back to figuring out, okay, we have to build a community. We have to get a community manager. We have to create content and roadmaps around, okay, people are going to get this tool, but sometimes people don't know how to set a goal. They're like, oh, my goal this year is to lose some weight. It's like, well, technically, if you lost half a pound, you would hit your goal, but that's not really what you want. So we really had to educate people on exactly how to get what they wanted and create systems for them. So because we had some margin to play with, we, we were able to create th- create content and things to help them use the product better. And I think that for us was key because we created a community of people and really not just worked on selling them once. So if you sell someone once, the key to building business is to have people coming back. If you're constantly having to get new customers, it's just really expensive, especially with like Facebook and everything just getting more and more expensive. So the more you can look after your current people. So for us from Kickstarter, you give your Kickstarter people maybe like a 10% lifetime discount or whatever to have them come back. And then you help them find success with whatever the product is. So for me, it's like good product, good way of showing people what success looks like and then giving them like a roadmap to get there is what I find the easiest way to create a business after Kickstarter. And then also what other products could we create? What other problems do they have? And if the reason we created the community was initially we're just like, oh, let's do something that's more than just a Kickstarter. And what it turned into is like we're hearing all of these other issues people are having. And then we're also hearing feedback on product. We were sharing new products in there and then they were giving us feedback on it. So it turns into this like product development, pre-selling, helping people with more problems and helping you create more products. And I think that really helped us after Kickstarter. Yeah. So you've, you've got uh, two products you launched on Kickstarter. How many products have you launched off of Kickstarter? Um, so it looks like you have like 40 products, it seems I like. I think we have about 20 okay. products right now. So how the, the things that you learn from launching on Kickstarter were those things that you would also integrate into your, let's call them private launches or, you know? Yeah, I think Kickstarter is great because it forces you to create assets for the product before it exists because you're trying to sell people on it. And it's it's like rocket fuel where if you did that for each product, it it definitely is great. So I think creating a story around each product is like we we have a process now with our product of creating a story around it before it really exists to make sure that we're creating something useful because there was a time I think a year or so into business when you're kind of chasing revenue Mm -hmm. and so we had a product person on board and and it turned into me too products or things that we could create and I guess we could sell but I didn't think really fit in or were unique to our brand And so it took us until I created this sort of system of filter of how you put stuff out and killing products that didn't make sense before we put money into production that we were like, okay, we need to have this process every time we put out a product. So we need to create a story around it and why people are actually going to want it and then treat it kind of like a Kickstarter. It's like we create a video for the Kickstarter. We created... Um, why people would want it. We didn't just say, oh, here's another product you can buy also. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'm kind of (laughs) guilty. Here at Beard Brand, we're kind of guilty of that. It's like, oh, we got this new product. 
Oh, we, no, we've done it. Yeah. It works for a while. And then it's almost like that, that initial push that you have doesn't, it's just like, it's a launch and it's a spike and then it doesn't last because you haven't created that story around it. So with every new product you're doing now, are you creating a video and, and tying that into like a landing page on your blog or talk a little bit more about the technical setup of, of your launches? So we have tier A, tier B, tier C products. And this is something when I looked at sales, it's like the majority of sales are coming from tier A products. So it's like the self journal, the, the frameworks that help people achieve something. And then there's tier B, which help you do something with tier A products. So, so a tier B product might be a, like a cover for the journal. It's like really nice leather, but it doesn't help you do anything, but people love it with the journal. And then tier C are more branded products, add-ons. So, so tier A will do a video and we'll do as much content around the tier A products. And then the other ones are more add-ons. So we don't really put the time in. So tier C is like say if it's like 80, say it's like 70, 20, 10, I don't want to spend more than 10% of my time on tier C products. They do bring in revenue, but they're not like, it's almost like if you created all that stuff, it would be such a waste of time because people are either going to buy it or they're not like a pen that we sell on top of it. It's like, if we create all this content, they might still buy it and they might not, but like, that's a lot of time wasted on a, on a low value product. Okay. That's pretty interesting. I've never even thought of um, tiering products like that before in terms of priority and, and uh, focus of, of launches and things like that. And then uh, you do send them to a blog and, or do you have like landing pages with? We quick, usually quick send them to a landing page. Okay. Uh, talk about how you build out those landing pages and, and how does that work with you? You guys are on Shopify. Yeah. How does it tie in with that? Awfully. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're currently working on a new site. I, I don't find Shopify very conducive with these landing pages that are on brand. Like there's apps that let you create landing pages, but it's dr- really difficult to not make it feel like a landing page that's separate from your site. Um, so we're working on how do we create sort of a framework of like, okay, this is what we do every single time because we, usually we like to make it sort of custom built around the product but that's a little difficult so ideally we in the next three to four months we'll have a landing page that's on the site that feels like we're not it's not like the weird stepbrother that's I've been added on that doesn't really fit with the rest of it but um, custom building it every single time within Shopify was a little struggle. So it's, I'm, I'm just very design oriented. So right. whenever I see something off, I'm just like, Oh my God. But I know that that's just my problem and most people won't notice it. But for me, I just really want that customer experience to be, um, feel really good. Cause I know that I notice that stuff whenever I buy a product and I'm more likely to come back if it feels smooth. Yeah. So it's kind of like a, a web designer to, to designer. Like, is it, um, is it like a Shopify buy button then that, that you put We've on? We've done the, that on the click funnels. Yeah. Cause everything will be handled on, on Shopify's back end, right? Yeah. It kind of feeds into there. Yeah. I think we have click funnels that feeds in and then we've used, uh, Zipify, I guess. Okay. And then we use card hook for upsells. Okay. It's kind of a Frankenstein <laughs> system currently, but we're, we're making some updates soon. So it feels more, um, all in one piece. Yeah. What do you guys use? So we're on Shopify and we've kind of, um, just come to terms with like the limitations of the platform and then try to work within the platform rather Mm -hmm. than changing it. Almost kind of like our business model, like accept who you are and just like, okay, well, this is who I am. And, uh, you know, life's going to be a lot easier if we just kind of play within those confounds. Yeah. You know, it's limiting as well because you have these these visions for things that you want to do that maybe are beyond the platform. Right. So the goal is, you know, how do you grow the business to eight figures where you can afford a more robust platform or something mm-hmm. like that, that that really fits your needs. But I also feel like everyone has problems at every stage, no matter right. what. I don't think that's going to make or break your business. That's just optimizing. So if you're just starting a business, like 
it's really figuring out, okay, how do I create a site that makes sales? And then you can always sell from a blog as long as you have every, all the other pieces. Yeah. One last question I want to know uh, as we wrap up the Kickstarter is like, how do you maintain the communications between when the Kickstarter is over and the product comes in? Is there a content strategy for those six months or nine months or whatever when, when the product's being produced? So we didn't have like an actual strategy around it. We just kind of, the better way to do it is to, for me, I don't like to waste people's time. So I don't want to contact them and just be like, Hey, everything's going great. Cause I'm like, yeah, but in Kickstarter, it's better that you communicate more than less just to let people know, Hey, we're working on it. Sending, you know, updates on even small little details. Most people won't read it, but then you have these hardcore people that I think sit on Kickstarter and wait for the updates and they will appreciate it. So every two, two to three weeks is pretty okay. standard for like a good communication base with people. And it's it, the communication is mostly about the production of the products and how it's coming. Or whatever out. your story is. So you could set expectations. Like you can set your own expectations. I'll do a monthly update or I'll do a every three weeks. And sometimes you won't have any product updates because, you know, you're it's in production and there's nothing to say. But you could say, oh, we this we building out the store or um, we just created this discount code for you for our store, whatever it is, you can create a story around each update. The important thing is that you don't go dark so that people don't know where you are because they'll just assume that you've run off with their money. Yeah. Where can people find out more about you and more about your business? And what's the best way to get in contact with you if they have any more questions? Uh, so best self is our business, bestself.co. And then my website is called littlemite.com. And that I have a lot of crowdfunding resources because I get asked a lot about Kickstarter. So I've got a lot of blog posts up there about exactly what we did, how we built our email list, how you do a video, like simple things like that. But um, that will be on littlemite.com. And that's M-I-G-H-T. Okay. It's like, because I'm small but mighty. <laughs> there you go. Well, this has been another e-commerce conversations on Kickstarter. Catherine, thank you so much for joining me. I had a lot of fun and getting excited about maybe the potential of doing a Kickstarter ourselves. That'd awesome. Thank you guys for listening. Cheers and keep on growing. Yeah.